Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today. It's my pleasure to welcome Billy and Acacia Caterley to the show. They retired at the ripe old age of 38, and I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing how they did it. They've been traveling for over 20 years now and just enjoying a fantastic lifestyle. And boy, I'm really curious. They do help other people do this same thing, and it sounds like they are living the good life. And and I think we can all learn from them. Billy and Acacia, welcome. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Jason. It's great to have you on, and I, I think all of the listeners are waiting with bated breath to hear your secrets to the good life. Tell us your story, if you would. Uh, you know, my first question, actually, when you retired at 38, were you wealthy? Did you sell a company, sell a bunch of real estate, or have a bunch of investments? Or did you just learn to live on less money in foreign countries? We were not, well, we're not wealthy, first of all. Let me get that clear. We were both working careers, and uh, we owned a restaurant in California at the time, as well as I was a a branch manager for, at that time, Dean Witter Reynolds, which is now uh, part of Morgan Stanley. So I was in the brokerage business, and we were making a pretty good living at the time. It was just that um, we felt this void of of travel, that that we would go to the Caribbean for two-week vacation, and it was just like, man, this is just a taste of what we could be doing all the time. So one thing led to another. And we started taking a look at our finances, and we started tracking how much money we were spending each year just on our lifestyle. If we excluded out work-related expenses like shoes and dry cleaning and and, and wardrobes and that kind of stuff, we realized that we were not spending all that much money specifically on ourselves just to live. And we did have a house in California at this time, and we basically liquidated everything. We we had quite a a bit invested um, in the financial markets, and we still do. And, but we liquidated our, sold our homes, sold our vehicles, sold, we had garage sales, sold our furniture, everything. Everything went, and we, we basically hit the road. Fantastic. Now, now, why did you do it? Were you just sick of the rat race? There's a great old saying, and I, I try to remind myself of it, and it goes like this. I'm sure you've heard it. Even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> Were you just kind of fed up with things? Was there a certain moment in your life when you just kind of realized we got to do something different? We got to change things, or, or what happened? Yeah, I, I think I think that that's pretty close to it. We came to a point in our lives where we looked at each other and said that you know either either our marriage could dissolve. I mean, that's one option that happens in California quite regularly, or um, we can we can um, try something different. And what we realized. Or, that we were never going to be as wealthy as Bill Gates uh, or Warren Buffett. I mean, I'm just, no matter how hard I worked, I wasn't going to catch up with these guys. And so it got to be a question of, well, how much is enough? And how much do you need? I mean, when it comes down to it, how much do you need to, to live your life on a daily basis and, um, and prepare for the future somewhat? We were starting to prioritize what was, in, what was valuable to us because at that particular time, I was running the restaurant and Bill was working at the financial department for Dean Witter. I was working nights, weekends, and holidays, and he was working during the day, so we didn't see much of each other. And Billy was the one that brought up the idea of early retirement, and I thought he was pretty nuts about that, pretty crazy idea. But when we started to prioritize what was important to us, we realized we could actually do something like this. We took two years to plan it. We didn't just uh, come in one weekend and, and make this decision and quit on Monday. We took two years, and we didn't really we didn't discuss it with anyone. That was one of the things. Acacia and I kind of kept this very quiet to ourselves until we both gave two week notices, and that was it. Wow. Wow. That's quite amazing. So tell us about your adventure. Where did it start? I guess this is now 21 years ago, right? That's correct. 21 years ago. 1991, January of 1991, we uh, we stopped working and we went to the Caribbean island of Nevis, Nevis, West Indies. And uh, we had been there before on, on uh, 
sailing tours, but this time we went down there to live for about six months. And that kind of got us, in Nevis, we were saying that if you want a hamburger today, you better order it yesterday, because that's how slow it is. Uh, island time then, huh? Island time. Yeah. Yep. And so so we, I, we specifically decided to go there because I wanted to hit the wall. I didn't want to be tempted to get back into something else. I wanted just to completely stop and just slow down and start smelling the roses. So you lived there for six months, and I mean, was that a big culture shock for you? You had to order your hamburgers in advance, I know that. <laughs> but what was it like when you, you moved there? I mean, did you just rent a place, or how did you decide where to live on, on that island? Yeah, we rented a house, and at this time, we, we rented it with some other people. Um, the, the Four Seasons Resort was opening their first Four Seasons um, uh, Resort, <laughs> They hadn't, they hadn't gone in this direction before. They used to be just uh, hotels in major cities, high-class hotels. So a friend of mine was the executive chef there, and so we went down there and knowing he was going to be there. And we had been to the island before, and I knew about the diving, and I knew about the fresh lobsters, and I loved the white sand beaches. And um, so, so we went down there, and, and we actually chipped in and, and helped him open the restaurant because uh, I've got chef training, and Acacia's got skills of the restaurant as well. We have, I helped him open the Four Seasons restaurant there in exchange for food. You did a barter then, huh? And I mean, barter deals, I, I find them interesting, but I don't usually find they're very easy to actually make happen in real life. People want to do things more officially, but I guess in many foreign countries, it's, that's not the case so much, is it? Oh, absolutely. Barter is, is a huge tool that we use. Because we have restaurant background, Billy is a French chef, we've been able to trade lodging for cooking many times. And I learned Thai massage, and so I exchange Thai massage for whatever else somebody can give to us. And we do barter quite a bit, actually. That's fantastic. Yeah, you won't find yourself doing that in the States very much, will you? Not like around the world. No, in these developing nations, it's very common. Yeah, fantastic. So tell us about the rest of your adventure then. So you did that, and you were there for six months. What was what was after that? Well, then we, went, we sailed down further south into Venezuela. We ran around Venezuela for a while. And then we uh, flew back to the States, and we bought an RV. We bought a fifth wheel. Hey, before you get into the road trip part, i got to ask you about Venezuela, because obviously that's a communist country. What was it like back then? I, I don't know much about what Venezuela was like 20 years ago. It was, it was more of a democracy, and obviously Chavez was not, was not the president at the time. And it was fine. Um, I mean, they've got the most gorgeous women, Jason, in the world. I think I don't know how many Miss Universe crowns they own, but they must own a lot of them. Really? Wow, I thought that was mostly confined to Russia and Ukraine and stuff like that. I like the Eastern Europe myself, but uh, I'll have to check that out. I'd love to go there. That sounds we great. stayed on an island, Isla de Margarita, and it, it, it was international. We were able to eat uh, international cuisine and have coffee lattes, and we went to the beach just about every day for just pennies on the bus, and we stayed about a month down there. It was real, real affordable. It was gorgeous. Very exciting. And they have a, on their census, you know how in the States we have, what, black, white, and other or something like that? Hispanic. Hispanic or whatever these days. They have 200 shades of colors on their census. Venezuela, then the road trip. I used to own a large motor home and loved those road trips. Those were fun. How long did you do that for? You did that with a fifth wheel, right? Yeah, we, took, we bought a, a used pickup truck and a used fifth wheel. You know, these things can be had for, for pennies on the dollar if, you, if you're patient and look around. And uh, we traveled the western United States. We spent one part of a summer up in Montana on a friend's ranch. He just bought this, this uh, ranch up there, and he actually had an RV hookup. So we were in Whitefish, Montana, which is God's country up there. And we did that until about, uh, well, we, owned, we, we kept the rig for quite a few years, but we started traveling internationally in 93. Then it was it was a while in the RV, and did you go everywhere in the states? Did you have a favorite, or well, we, like I said, we just did the Western U.S. and a favorite. Oh, well, I mean, we spent two weeks in the Grand Canyon, the South Rim of Grand Canyon. That's just awesome. Um, up by Glacier National Park, we exchanged our cooking skills for lodging up there. Uh, the, down the we we did Highway One down the Pacific Coast. Gorgeous in Oregon. Oregon, California. That really is gorgeous. It's, it's totally beautiful. So on the international trip, where did you go next internationally? We came to Mexico. We actually came here to Chapala, Mexico, planning to stay two months, and we stayed four years. Wow, so that was a big hit with you, huh? Yeah, the weather here is just very temperate, and it's, it's eternal spring is what they call it. 
It's supposedly the second best climate in the world. Really? And and uh, where is Japala? Is that how you pronounce it properly? That's correct, Japala. It, we're about uh, 40 minutes south of Guadalajara, and it's on the largest lake in Mexico called Lake Japala. And it's what makes, we're even, below, even though we're below the Tropic of Cancer, if my geography is correct, we're a mile high. We're 5,000 feet in elevation. Oh, that's why that climate is so nice, because you're, you're getting close to the equator, but the altitude gives you a really nice mix of climates, I bet. That's exactly correct. Today, it'll be in the mid, mid to lower 80s, and we had the lows this morning um, in the high 40s. And, and what is the population there? Oh, I'd say about 40,000 people. And so you're, so you're living in a, in a small town. I mean, are there any expats there, or is it pretty much very traditional in Spanish? This is the largest expat community in the world. Is it really? Wow. Tell us how you found out about it, first of all. We, we've had some friends um, through travel and through email communication, and they invited us to meet them here in Chapala. When we arrived, they um, had us a house rented that we shared And we just love this place. We got involved with the community right away. Uh, Billy started to build the tennis courts at a federal park. And, you know, I got into teaching English. And so it was just, we just kind of slipped right into the natural life. We learned Spanish from the locals. And I taught English to the kids. And we found out that it was one of the largest expat communities. So, like, if we really needed other people who spoke English, we were able to find friends to do so. If we wanted to have food that we recognized, we could go to an a Western style of, of restaurant, but otherwise we live pretty much locally. Back then, we were here, like I said, in the early 90s, 93 is when we first came here. And back then, the Internet had not been con- been invented. Um, there was no cable TV in Chapala at that time. There's a large uh, American Legion post here. And on the weekends, everybody would gather the American Legion to watch the football games. And it just, it was a real social thing. It was like, I don't know, it's, it was going back in time back then. We read 50 books in one year. We didn't even have a television. And then as time progressed, you know, they got cable in here, and now everybody's got cable TV. Of course, now everybody's got Internet. So it's just progressing. Mexico's uh, middle class is, is being developed quite rapidly. It sounds like you don't have any concern about the drug cartels or any of that kind of stuff that's going on. That probably only affects larger towns and cities, I assume? Yes, mostly. The, the concern, yes, yeah, sure, we all read about the news of what's going on, but... 99% of it is, is uh, gang on gang related stuff. And so as long as you stay out of the, you know, don't get involved with that stuff, then you're going to be fine. And so you, you stayed there for four years. So now where are we, about 1996, maybe? Yeah, something like that. Well, what had happened at that point where my parents became ill and I started to do end of life care for my parents and my father had died and then I spent the next two and a half years off and on uh, doing end-of-life care, and Billy did some travel on his own. So, you know, he was flying back and forth to Mexico, and and um, at some point in time, then he started going to uh, Asia, and that's how we started going to Asia. It was about in the year 1999 or so. Tell us about your Asia experiences. Well, I went over first on my own for a month to Thailand, and uh, Acacia is very uh, craft-oriented. She likes artistic things with crafts involved. And the fabrics that I found over there were just unbelievable, the silk and, and whatever else they, they do. And I, I would kept telling her about it, so I came back, and it was like two months later I was dragging her over there, and she was just sold on it. Yeah, they, they've got fabrics and, and supplies from India and China, Japan, just the whole thing. It's, it's the whole Pacific Rim, the whole Asian idea of, of life, and it's much, much different than... Latino, you know, it's a whole different culture. There are lots, they're 80 some percent Buddhist and that type of thing. So it was a completely different switch of, of focus for us on our travels. And we fell in love with it. The food is awesome. The, the climate is hot and humid. The people are, are very, very nice. And it's so easy to travel. I, like I said, the first time I was on my own and I was traveling on my own, and I couldn't believe how the ease I was able to get around. And in, in you're referring to Thailand. Thailand, that's correct. Where in Thailand, by the way? Based out of Chiang Mai. So you liked that quite a bit, but you didn't stay there. Where did you go next? Well, we did a quite a bit of travel um, in that whole year, area. Australia, New Zealand, Bali, the Philippines, China, Vietnam, wow. Laos. Just that, that whole area. We stayed over. We traveled back and forth from um, there to 
uh, our place in the States, and then sometimes we'd stop back here in Mexico, but we probably spent about six years traveling all around Asia and the, the neighboring countries, because once, once you're over in that area, the countries are so close by that you fly out of Bangkok, and it's, it's so much cheaper than, say, flying out of, of uh, Los Angeles or New York. Because you're already over the ocean, you're already on that side of the world. Oh, sure, sure. I always thought it would be so great to live in Europe because a weekend trip, you get a whole other country, a completely different culture, maybe a, 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 a one-day trip even. It's the same, not an hour flight out, one hour flight out of Bangkok and you're in Vietnam. Fantastic. So you liked that, and you were traveling around Asia. Did you do anything to earn income over there? Well, at this point, we had written our first book, The Adventurer's Guide to Early Retirement, in 2005. So at that point, we were selling our book online, and we were writing um, stories. We were writing for The Motley Fool, for instance, and, and this type of thing about how it was that we were able to manage our finances and live overseas and retire early and this type of thing. So, yeah, we were selling our book online at that time. And I mean, the book was enough to make a living, though, because very few books actually make money. Usually they're done for uh, other reasons, uh, unless you're a big celebrity or you really have high, high sales on them. But the book really did produce income, huh? Well, yeah, it produces income even to today. But but that's not how we derive our, our income. Our income is all comes off of investments. We're structured heavily into the Standard & Poor's 500. And... Even after the rough 10 years that we've been through, what we're all calling the lost decade, since the day we retired, the S&P has produced a 7.2% annual return. Yeah, you were you were lucky to be in early, though. I mean, the last 10 years after inflation, people have definitely lost money, and that's based on the government inflation stats. But, but before that, it was a nice ride, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it really was. And, you know, I, Jason, I have uh, faith in our, in our system and our corporations to be able to produce it revenues. So is it how much longer this is going to last? I don't know. But we're going to come out of it at some point. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. I was actually going to ask you, when you were talking about your experience in Mexico initially, it really sounded a lot like you were working, but I assume that the sort of retirement jobs, teaching English, helping build the tennis courts, etc., those weren't too onerous. Those were probably pretty pretty nice and, and laid back. Or, I mean, you weren't working too many hours, were you? Well, <laughs> well you know, it's all volunteer. Yeah, it's all volunteer. Oh, that was volunteer. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. What, what happened is I got involved with the sporting community here, and my first project was I was coaching a women's basketball team. We have a, g- a local gym, and I had a gr- everybody from a grandmother to the kids on my team. I had a, 13 women. <laughs> Grandmother to the children, huh? That's amazing. The whole, whole family just about. And uh, it, we had no scoreboard. They were using a flip chart and a stopwatch in the gym here for a scoreboard. And so I knew by now my friends in the States were, were becoming principals and administrators in, in schools, in the school system. And so one time when I went back to Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I was from, and my folks were, were living there, I ran into some friends of mine, and I, and I asked them if I could get them to donate a scoreboard. And one thing led to another, led to another, and they, they, they referred me to the gentleman who they buy the, the products from. And so I went and had a meeting with him, and he offered to donate a board if I flew it down here. So I got that into the gym, and that was a big hit. And then I got involved with the tennis community, and we had four courts that were falling apart. And so I went to the city with another friend of mine, and, and we offered to take them over again for free. But all the revenue that the courts produce will be put back into them. Well, we, we started cleaning them up, up and resurfacing the courts, new nets and windscreens, etc. And the, the community started latching on. I mean, we started getting 200 players out for these things. And we needed more courts. And so I raised about 35000 U.S. dollars. And I, I built two more courts for us. So now we have a total of six. 
I, I want to get sort of your advice and tips to people that are thinking of, of doing this and really having this kind of dream lifestyle. But just bring us up first quickly on, we've got four more years we've got to catch up on. Did you just come back to Mexico after the Asia experience and, and, and you've been there since or, or something else? Yes, pretty much. We, we do have a home base in, in the States that we rotate out of from time to time, but we figure we spend about 70% overseas around the U.S., yeah, fantastic. Well, so what what tips would you have for people that are thinking of doing this? I mean, there's all kinds of questions. There are visas, there are getting permits to work in foreign countries, there's currency, there, there's just a million issues. I mean, what would you like people to know? Well, the first thing I would suggest is if you're interested in doing foreign travel, for ex- not just a tourist, but for an extended period of time, first thing you do is set yourself up with a brokerage account like Fidelity or Vanguard that has a money market fund tied to it, which they all do these days, where you're able to get a debit card and you can access funds in the local currency from any ATM in the world. That's a big deal. Okay, but you can you can do that with a normal bank ATM card. I mean, when I go into foreign countries, I just use my ATM card from my bank. Same thing or different? It's Well, it's the same, same, but different, as I say in Thailand. If you're on the same system, some banks, like Bank of America, has one branch here that you can extract funds from. I can go to any ATM here. Right. Yeah, I haven't had that. I haven't had problems. I just go to any ATM and it works. They do charge you that service fee, though. You'll pay a buck or two, maybe. We we get ours reimbursed through Fidelity. Good. Okay. What else? Well, I would say to simplify your life so that you're not things you're not using back in the states. We are car free now, so we don't have a car that we're just sitting there paying insurance for or having all the seals be rotted or or drying out. We have all of our. Um, most probably 90 some percent of our mail is all done electronically. We have electronic payments. If I need to, to send a check to someone up north for any reason at all, it's all done electronically. I can, through our Fidelity account, I can have a check issued to anyone and they mail it. They, they put it in the envelope and they post it. I don't pay for any of that. It's all free service. So, you know, it's a matter of simplifying um, one's life, getting the mail all taken care of so that you're not receiving hard copies places to do everything electronically, that's real helpful. And then once you're in a country, our advice is to get local. Meaning shop with a local shop, eat with a local Z, and make as many local friends as possible. Because they know where the best shopping is, they get the best prices, and they're the most fun. Right, right. And the most interesting for sure. What about internet access? I mean, that sounds like it could be a minor detail, but nowadays it's not. It's a big deal, especially if you want to sell online and banking. Internet access, I'd say speed and security and cost. Any challenges there? Not anymore. Um, we just last year, this time last year, we, we embarked on a 105-day adventure through the uh, Pacific coast of Mexico into Guatemala, Belize, back up into the Yucatan and then back to this to Chapala. We took a little over three months to do that trip, and we were online almost every day. There was only one or two instances where we, where we had to really struggle to track down some Internet abilities. So it's getting more and more uh, available even in these nations. Have you had any bad experiences, uh, security, theft? Have you ever felt threatened or unsafe? Has anything like that occurred? We always keep a very low profile. Uh, we don't... Uh, dress to the nines. We don't wear jewelry, you know, big pieces of jewelry. We don't We don't flash cash or any of our digital toys. We separate our money in, in different locations, either on our body or in our hotel room or in the hotel safe. We uh, wrap up our digital equipment with a pack safe. That's a steel cable type of safe and lock that to something that's not transportable like the pipes in the, in the bathroom or something that's uh, attached to the wall in a, in a um, hotel room. We don't uh, walk around the streets in the early mornings. We don't get blasted on alcohol so that we forget where we live. You know, those types of things. A lot of it is common sense. We've not had any issues other than just sometimes taking pictures of people. People can get upset. Oh, really? They get upset. Is that in like the Asian countries? They have kind of customs about that type of thing or, or where? Actually, it happened to me in Belize of all places. But, you know, uh, it could be anybody at any time. You know, know? it happened to us once in in Nevis with someone that uh, wasn't very friendly to tourists. It happened to us a couple times in San Cristobal and Chiapas, Mexico, because those particular people in that particular location uh, didn't want their photos taken. And so, you know, you just don't always know, but it's 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 um, be discreet with one's camera. 
Very good advice. What about visas and, and working in foreign countries? We've never had a work visa. The stuff we do is all volunteer, so we haven't required it because there's no money transacted. Or we do an exchange, a barter exchange, which there's no money transacted. But, but many many gringos here in this area do have work visas because they sell real estate. That That's a big deal with those guys. Oh, really? Boy, I just when I thought everybody in California was a realtor. <laughs> you can't get away from them, can you? They all moved here. They should. But, you know, like you say, if you have an Internet business and you've got things online and your your uh, money is located in the States and with, with United States accounts, then you're not really stuck with having to have a work visa anywhere. Generally, in our experience, we are on visitors' visas, and so we don't we don't have to have necessary papers to work because we're not taking local currency in exchange for work. Now, regarding visas, I'll give you a couple examples. One here is Mexico. Upon arrival, you can get a 180-day visa. That's a six-month visa. So that's you know that's a good amount of time. And then you, then, and that's free. And you and then you just leave the country. You can leave the country and come right back in the same day if you want to. In Thailand, we get a, a one-year visa. And these these you got to kind of research a little bit online. And that one costs about 180 U.S. dollars now. But we do have to leave the country every 90 days. But we can do that as many times as we want. And every time we come back in, we get a fresh. Uh, 90 day extension and that's good for up to one year or actually you can extend it for 15 months theoretically if you go out on the last day and in in mexico for example where you are now the place you've stayed the longest do you own a property there do you rent a property are you living at a resort like as a long-term guest or what are you doing we are in a rental and we've rented from the same lady for 15 years here and she'll only rent to us Wow, yeah, that's fantastic. May I ask what your rental cost is? It's about $300 a month. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and we have fully new equipment in the kitchen. We have brand new refrigerator, brand new uh, uh, six burner gas stove, microwave. You know, we've got a view of the mountains, you know, hot running water, all that kind of stuff. Fresh new tile, everything. We One of the things that we recommend often in our books and on the website is that if you deal with locals, you're going to get a much better price for just about everything. If you, if you try to work with the expat, they're going to charge more, of course, because they do. You know, If you try to learn some survival phrases in the local language, you can make business with the local people and get better prices for just about everything, including rentals. We don't own property in any other place because it's cheaper to rent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It definitely does. Well, good, good stuff. Give out your website if you would and so people can know where to learn more. Okay, you can go to retireearlylifestyle.com. Our email address is there on the website as well. We offer several books on travel and on retirement. And if you write to us, we will write back to you. And our website is retireearlylifestyle.com. Fantastic. Well, Billy and Acacia, thank you so much for sharing all these insights today and just enjoy your prolonged vacation. It sounds sounds great. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. And tomorrow we're heading to the town of Tequila for about three or four days. Well, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Bye-bye. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.